particular hero of mine, and that is the love of guns from a very early age. In my case, I'm glad to say it's worn off. But in Pershavalsky's case, he was the great explorer of Central Asia, it never wore off. Well, oh, Bertie, obviously I can't take these in any way. Very sadly there, but I really must not. Ah. Must not forget this. Pershavalsky, Mongolia, one and two. And look at that. I'll bet you think that's Stalin. Well, no. Some people say that's Stalin's father. But we'll find out. I was born in the wrong century. That's what my friends tell me, and I'm afraid they're right. I should have lived in the 19th century, when most of the world still had to be discovered. I should have been one of those brave men who left the safety and warmth of their homes to explore the blank areas on the globe, those places where no white man had ever set foot. Without those men, the world would not be as it is today. This is it. This is the scenery my hero saw from his tent in the morning when he woke up. Sometimes, my heroes carry names I can hardly pronounce. Let me try it for you. Nikolai Nikailovitz Pershavalsky. He was Russian, so you're supposed to say Pershavalsky. And here he is. We're talking about the second part of the 19th century. The Russians and the British were fighting their so-called great game a kind of Cold War. Both countries wanted to obtain influence in this unknown part of Central Asia. That's why Pershavalsky was here, an explorer paid by the Russian Ministry of War. Five times he left Russia in order to reach Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. Five times he failed. But what a fascinating man he was. A tough man, also. In the freezing cold and the unbearable heat, he just kept going on. Listen to this. Prashalsky in Mongolia. Our poor beasts were dying of starvation. And one of the horses was frozen to death at night. The sick camel expired two days afterwards and lay directly in front of the entrance of our tent, completing the picture of our misery. We were now left with only one horse, which could hardly move its legs. I love Pershavalsky. He succeeded then and now in dividing the world into people who adore him and people who hate him. Like the man who lives here, for instance, Donald Rayfield, his biographer. Well, oh, welcome. How do you do? Wonderful. Right. Good to see you. So what kind of a man was he? Well, he was single-minded. Uh, he was frightened of nothing and of nobody. He was absolutely ruthless without pity, I would say. Oh. And he could be cruel to the point of sadism and vindictive. The better Rayfield came to know Pershavalsky, the more he started to dislike him. When he was halfway through his biography, he realized he couldn't wait to let his main character die. 
Still, let's try one more question about the impression my hero made on other people. Um, but what would a, a Chinese villager have thought seeing Pashalsky appearing what? with his... Yes, it's hard to imagine. Here is a Chinese or Mongolian or Tibetan who may not have seen a European before, just knew them as foreign devils, uh, or expect them to come with a Bible and some boring talk about Jesus. And what do you get? You get this giant uh, with a whole lot of Cossacks on horseback, and he has enough arm armaments and munitions to equip a whole army. Modern rifles, the sort of which they, they, they had matchlocks and flintlock guns. And here was a man with the latest carbines, the latest revolvers coming towards them. It, it was uh, you know, Operation Shock and Awe in, yes. in American terms. Yes. Uh, they were totally uh, horrified. And, why, and he was obsessed with if they getting to Lhasa, getting to Tibet, why? Well, I suppose simply because it was impos considered impossible. Oh. Um, and if Pushevowski ever heard the word no, then he would persist. He and he persisted and persisted. And of course, the other reason is that it was regarded as the center, the spiritual center of the Buddhist world. And it was important for Russia to be there before the British got there. And I think that may be one of his chief motives. <laughs> So, what have we got? He's a sadomasochistic homosexual. He's brutal. He has thoughts of genocide in his head. Well, yes. But you don't need to be a sweetheart to be a great explorer. For that, you need courage, endurance, and scientific knowledge. And he had all of those in abundance. And besides, what do they think of him here in Russia? Well, in Russia, he's a hero. And if you're considered a hero in Russia, you'll have to have your own statue. Проживальский очень очень известный путешественник. Вот есть улица Проживальского, она находится тут недалеко. Он путешествовал в Азии на верблюдах, там открывал новые места. И он действительно очень похож. Как бы есть такая версия, но это больше, наверное, юмор, что Сталин был его сыном, но это юмор, конечно, нет, но они немного похожи, есть такое. Это Сталин. Нет, это не Сталин. Это не Сталин. Но это смешно, это смотрит как Сталин. Это смотрит как Сталин. Но кто это? Это Приживальский, но он смотрит как Сталин, но для меня мустаж не так. Спасибо вам очень, очень. Спасибо, спасибо. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a nice Bye -bye. Well, this is the Geographical Museum, supported by Putin. And uh, inside, I hope we're going to find some letters and Prochalski's maps. But much more importantly for me, we are going to see, I hope, a Lancaster rifle. Now, I've always wanted to hold Prochalski's magnificent Lancaster. There were only two, two models of this beautiful rifle in Russia at the time. One owned by the Tsar and one owned by Prochalski, made specially for him. Big man. Ah. Reverend Anne. Ah, you're concentrating. Wonderful to meet you. Maria Fedorovna guards everything that's left from Pershavalsky. Oh, some gloves. His letters, his pictures, and most of his personal belongings. Да, мне он очень понравился бы, наверное, сразу, поскольку это была личность незаурядная. Он сразу как-то умел понравиться людям. Но тоже с раннего детства проявился его характер. Он был лидером, он был целеустремленным и в то же время был человеком таким азартным. Before we look at the maps and the letters, am I 
May I hold the Lancaster? Пожалуйста. Да, но сейчас вот на, на, мы его принесли из реставрации. В общем-то, вот здесь одно уберем. Вот, вот проживальский, вот yeah. мой кружок такой. Вот, тихо. Got it. Да. Да, 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 да. It's all so classy. Да, да. No. Can we take that one out? Massive. That is massive bullet. <laughs> that is a real Superman's oh. stuff. And that's why this, this is so very heavy. Yeah, My God, yeah, it would go I in. I'm not going to push it in in case it jams. But that would give you the most terrible <laughs> bruise on your shoulder. And so heavy, you'd have to bring it up as one does with a rifle. You get the foresight and the backsight, get it all set level. And you'd have to bring it up uh, and then through the target, far as the target came into view. You couldn't stand there with this and hold something this heavy level. And this barrel has to be massively heavy because it's taking such pressure from this huge bullet uh, expanding in the heat and moving down the barrel at tremendous speed. So that's what it means, a patent smooth bore, breech loading rifle. Lancaster. Well, boys, toys. So I got what I wanted. I held my hero's gun. What else? Well, there should be letters in which he writes frankly about how he enjoyed spending the night with three of his assistants in one sleeping bag. But I don't expect Maria to show those to us. Wow. To his uh, young men, the people that he, well, he trained them, but he was always worried that they might get married, this terrible thing, uh, because that would mean that they were no longer um, available to travel with him. Также его товарищ еще по Варшавскому училищу и спутник двух путешествий Клон женился и тоже больше не, пути, не участвовал в экспедиции. Поэтому, когда Пыльцов решил жениться, он тоже вот ему пишет: не женись, не женись. Yeah, don't marry him, don't marry. The thing that stuck in my mind is that before he could start writing his diary, he had to melt the ink in the high mountains he had to heat up his ink over a fire think how cold that was how is he going to write in big gloves um, it's an extraordinary achievement so why do you like him so much would you like to be his wife <laughs> Maybe. Now look, I think that if Prashalsky liked women, you would be his first choice. Я бы ваши тоже хотела стать. Ваши бы хотела стать. She would like to be your wife. Oh, really? A wonderful. That's even better. Fantastic. Yes, yes, yes. Lovely. I was warned beforehand about this striking Russian woman who now suddenly wants to marry me. She adores Pershavalsky, I was told. So don't you dare to bring up any question suggesting that the great Russian explorer might have been gay. Right. Well, here we go. So do you think the rumours were true that he was... Um, Homosexual. <laughs> Maybe I should phrase a more subtle question. No. But in this country, could you be a great hero and a homosexual? Of course. Ah, well, great. I hope you don't. While during Pershavalsky's days, homosexuality was quite common and accepted, today it seems to be a silly taboo for the Russians. The logic is simple. Homosexuals can't be heroes. So Russian heroes can't be homosexual. 
But enough about people. Let's focus on animals. Thanks to his British-made Lancaster rifle, Perchevalsky killed thousands of animals. He transported them all to St. Petersburg to the Zoological Museum here on the edge of the Neva River. Well, maybe there's something wrong with me. Well, it's a lot wrong with me, but I love these places. This great zoological museum here built like a palace, quite right too, a palace to scientific knowledge. And the great excitement is in this building are held the type specimens, the holotypes, which means the very first individual of an entirely new species that arrived here, first time it was seen by scientists, the first time it was described, uh, and they should be lying in here. And if we're lucky, the, the ex-director of the entire museum, what better guide could you have, Potapov, should be waiting here to show us these skins, all collected by our great hero, Prashowski. Professor Potapov. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Professor Potapov was recommended to us as the great Perchevalsky expert. He is elated with all the attention. And to avoid the risk of disappointing his guests, he treats us to the full exhibition a two-hour tour through all the halls of this gigantic museum. Uh, the famous Dima, who was now uh, this male, found uh, it is 14 miles old. You see a little trunk here. It takes a while for Professor Potapov to find the crown jewel of the collection, Perchevalsky's horse. It's named after him, although Perchevalsky was given the skin and the skull somewhere as a present. Only later, in St. Petersburg, did they find out it was a rare example of a till then unknown wild horse. Uh, the first famous uh, obtaining of the Przewalski horse. Uh, wow. It's not, I don't suppose it's possible for me just to touch Przewalski's horse, is it? Well, this, this is Brzezowski's horse. Um, in 1881, it was um, described and named after him. I mean, you, can't, you can't name a species after yourself ever. A uh, very, very wild horse. Now, I just want to pat it neck. Um, but actually, if it was alive, I certainly wouldn't be able to do that. You'd get kicked to pieces. Prochalski's horses uh, hold the record for killing keepers in zoos. They are far more dangerous than tigers. Um, and I like that because it really is a bit like Prochalski himself. I share a common passion with the professor and with Perchevalsky, birds. On his trips to Tibet, Perchevalsky shot thousands of birds, which the common visitor is not allowed to see. But since we're both Perchevalsky admirers, the professor decides to take me down into his secret cellars. There, somewhere in one of the drawers, is the one bird that Perchevalsky shot with regret because he thought it was too beautiful to die. Here. In just a moment, I'll take the key. Yes. 
You got it? Yes. So beautiful. Even now, even as a specimen, it glows. What it must be like in the wild. Yes, this specimen was uh, uh, obtained by Nikolai Przewalski in northern Tibet, oh. uh, near Jagar mountain, in, in, in the June of 1880. Oh. Please. What a ravishingly beautiful creature. And Perszewalski shot them as he shot everything. Birds, elk, bears, sheep, antelope, camels. They had no chance against the man with the Lancaster rifle and the Purdy shotguns. In St. Petersburg, the employees of the Zoological Museum worked overtime to prepare all the skins he sent home. What a real man he was. Well, we're off to Moscow on one of the world's most romantic trains. You expect to see Anna Karenina alighting from one of these red 19th century carriages, or for that matter, Przewalski on his own triumphant return to St. Petersburg. At my request, Professor Potapov is joining us. He can't stop talking about Perszewalski. He admires the man. I call to mind my conversation in England with biographer Rayfield, who so obviously loathed Perszewalski. He has always been a Russian hero. That was the extraordinary thing. He was a Russian hero before the revolution and after the revolution, even though he was a... Um, a fighter for Imperial Russia. Uh, he shared quite a few things with, say, Joseph Stalin, his dislike of the British, extreme dislike of the British, uh, who were conquering India and Burma yeah, at the same absolutely. time, yeah. and um, his utter ruthlessness. Um, so when the Soviets republished his books, uh, they did so quite cheerfully, which is unusual for republishing a 19th century yes. geographer, but they had to leave certain things out that were just too shocking for the okay. Soviet image. About the Chinese and about the... Well, particularly in his last journey, when he'd uh, completed his fourth visit to Mongolia and northern Tibet, he wrote a, a chapter of recommendations to the Russian Ministry of Defence that they should exterminate the population of Mongolia oh, and of Tibet really? and settle Cossacks well, in both territories. Well, Execute uh, uh, Well, uh, yes, whatever way, starve them to death, uh, shoot them, uh, drive them out into China. But uh, he said they are laggards in the evolutionary process and they should be replaced by more modern specimens of human beings, namely Russian Cossacks. Here you can penetrate anywhere, only not with the Gospels under your arm, but with money in your pocket, a carbine in one hand, and a whip in the other. Europeans must use these to come here and bear away in the name of civilization all these dregs of the human race. A thousand of our soldiers would be enough to subdue all of Asia, from Lake Baikal to the Himalayas. Here, we can still repeat the exploits of Cortes. For our military conquests in Asia bring not only glory to Russia, they are also victories for the good of mankind. So now, here in Moscow, 
I'll check in at the Leningradskaya Hotel, built by Joseph Stalin as the Russian answer to the skyscrapers of New York. Here, I'll have to wait for my next appointment. The man I want to meet is very difficult to approach, so I don't know if we will succeed in persuading him to receive us. For the time being, for me, that means waiting. Maybe I was too optimistic with my waiting. No, our guest doesn't want to see us today. Nor tomorrow. Or the day after. But then, finally, yes. We're invited for a morning meeting. This is the Central Academy Theatre of the Russian Army. And its director today is the grandson of a man who murdered 35 million Russians. So why are we going to meet Stalin's grandson? Because rumors spread in the 1930s that Stalin was the son of Prushalsky. And it wasn't just hidden rumor, it was right out in the open. It was in all the papers, it was used in propaganda. Obviously, Stalin liked the idea himself. Нет, как ты носил вот тут так, так ее держи примерно, ага. и голову держи, тогда будет ощущ... понимаю, да, да. ощущение, что вроде она ну, живая. Хорошо, ладно, ага. потом просто это. Вот так вот ее держи, вот так держи, как, да? как будто голову поддерживаешь, и тогда, Класс, тогда, да, и тогда и принесешь сюда. Александр Васильевич, вот этот вот слух о том, что э, Прижевальский отец Сталина, вашего дедушки, откуда он э, появился, по вашему мнению, откуда это произошло? Ну, я вам скажу. А, э, Прижевальский э, имел э, нос с горбинкой, имел вот такие же усы, был черного цвета, и на очень многих фотографиях э, он напоминает, просто чисто визуально так напоминает Сталина. И больше за этим нет ровным счетом ничего. Но вы думаете, что а, а, Сталину это был слух, как бы ему этот слух нравился? Абсолютно безразличен. Убежден. Абсолютно был безразличен. Вам в вашей жизни как-то что-то вот принесло хорошего, тот факт, что вы внук Сталина? С Сталин не был человеком, с которым можно было быть в контакте, в таком очень таком близком контакте. И отец его очень боялся. боялся. Хотя и грешил много, и при этом все-таки его боялся. И он был для него, конечно, очень большим авторитетом, но Сталин любил Светлану, сестру, тетку мою, да? И он любил. Но и, и то это не значит, что он как бы, э, как сказать, квахтал вокруг нее, понимаете? Нет, этого не было. Этого никогда не было. Он был занят строительством, э, отнюдь не э, э, репрессиями, как это говоришь, такое ощущение, что он сидел в Кремле и только думал, кого пухнуть, понимаете? Ну, это тоже чепуха, конечно. А он строил свое царство. Вот, строил свое царство невероятно. И он, конечно, этим был занят с утра до ночи. Дети, отец ли, Светлана ли, так большой роли в его жизни никогда не играли. So here I am, sitting in this dark theater next to the grandson of Stalin. Only one handshake away from the dictator, you could say. What a disturbed childhood this soft-spoken man must have had. In order to leave history behind, he changed his name to Berdonsky 
but everybody knows he is Stalin's grandson. On top of that, some are still convinced he is also the great grandson of Pershavalsky. Tom, еще такой вещь я должен сказать, что это тоже не тайна, что Пржевальский вообще все свое время проводил главным образом на экспедициях, и он любил мужчин и мужскую компанию, а отнюдь не был ходаком по женщинам. Так что заляви. А вы можете сказать, вот почему как бы по России, вот мы разговаривали с многими людьми, которые там читали, ну, которые знали, изучали Пржевальскую. Почему для всех так вот тяжело тот факт, что, может быть, да, вот он любил э, мужчин, э, может быть, какого социалиста? От нечего делать. Понимаете? Какая разница? Кто? Альковные тайны вообще не должны никого никогда волновать. Мне, мне, ну, я так тоже думаю. Какая мне разница? Кого любил Чайковский, когда он был гений? Ну, какая мне разница? Он одаривал вас же не своим э, сексом или своим грязным бельем, он одаривал вас своим гением, своим талантом. А что он делал у себя дома, в койке, кому какое дело? Нет разницы? А, впечатление, что в России очень трудно быть героем и гомосексуалистом в одновременно. Всем быть трудно в России. И таланту трудно в России всегда. В России лучше всего быть Иванушкой-дурачком. Но не все же Иванушки-дурачки. I have to admit that I'm a bit disappointed that Stalin's grandson is not related to Prashalsky, but all the same. Here in this theatre he's rehearsing his Chekhov, and right behind me is a box built for Stalin. This whole theatre was built during his time, and he never showed up, but we're still not allowed to look in it even because it's still reserved for high officials, probably for Putin. Um, you get the feeling not much has changed. What's hidden behind that red curtain? I'm really getting curious. Fortunately, I find someone willing to give it another try. Открой, пожалуйста, потому что мы сейчас входим в фойе ложи дирекции, сейчас пойдем, и там вы прошли рядышком, быстро сняли, ладно? А потом ты закроешь. Все, отлично, спасибо. Угу, спасибо. But when we're halfway up, it seems as if somewhere in the building alarm bells started ringing. Suddenly, a plainclothes policeman shows up asking for official permissions, and we're supposed to wait. But then, much to my surprise, my hostess gets fed up with all the pomposity. She decides on a quick act of civil disobedience. Let's go. The president, the prime minister, prime and minister. other, uh, they sit here. They sit there. And why, why is and it? Go in the, in the, um, these the and secret this. way, I mean, it's a, no. no, not secret, but it's <laughs> different. Let's go. I feel a bit awkward. What a silly mystery play this is. You can still smell the Cold War here, everywhere. And then, what's the use of a military theater, anyway? Well, this ramp was made so that tanks could roll onto the stage. Imagine it, you'd see the end of the barrel first. T31. Oh. 
It's a bit much for one day. Let's try and summarize what we have so far. Pershavalsky's biographer in England wanted him dead as soon as possible. His famous horse is as aggressive as the explorer himself, and the keeper of his heritage in St. Petersburg would have loved to marry both him and me. And she tells me bluntly she hopes I'm not gay. <laughs> then, Bolshevalsky was not Stalin's father, at least according to Stalin's grandson. Yeah. Who is the first Russian we meet who doesn't talk about homosexuals as people from outer space. But the grandson of Stalin is obviously gay himself. La vie. And on top of that, a director in the Military Academy Theater of Moscow built by grandfather Stalin, who never showed up there himself. We're still not allowed to look in it even. Although everybody behaves around his theater box with awe and respect, Without. as if the dictator could arrive at any moment. In honor of the Red Army. What a crazy country this is. But I have to admit, I love it. I love every incomprehensible minute here. Back to Pershavalsky and to the only place in Russia where he felt at ease, his house in the village of Sloboda near Smolensk. It's a bumpy six hours by car. Professor Potapov promised to keep us awake with sad songs of love, death, and travel. <laughs> well, we're here because Pruszowski was here. This is the Russia that he loved, and I mean really loved. He grew up here and he built himself a house here, and what he liked doing best in life was hunting. His whole life, in fact, was an extension of his boyhood, uh, loose, playing in the woods, uh, enjoying himself, hunting, shooting, uh, as the English would say. And, well, it's amusing that here he found life so exciting he couldn't possibly write. He had to go to St. Petersburg, which was so horrible and confining and boring. And there he could write because he felt there was nothing else to do in the middle of this great city humming with life. For him, for Prusalski, this is where life was. This was humming with life. The idea is simple. We just wait here in silence, while from the other side of the wood, the beaters scare the animals in our direction. Then we only have to shoot them. It's easy. There's no sign of wild boar. It's 10 degrees below zero, which is cold if you're not allowed to move or to talk. After three hours of shivering, I suddenly get it. <laughs> Great hero. <laughs> Here, the fun of hunting has nothing to do with shooting animals, of course. And then it's not hard to understand why Pershavalsky loved this hunting so much. Он не любил начальство, и почему он все время путешествовал, одно из объяснений того, что там не было начальников. И он как бы вот был предоставлен сам себе, и 
вместе со своим отрядом, ну, выбирал путь, маршрут, все, ну, и он очень не любил долго задерживаться где бы то ни было, то есть светскую жизнь практически не вел, семьи у него не было, любимой женщины не было, солдатами и в, в походах, то есть Средняя Азия, это вот было его любимое, как бы, место и э, здесь он был только как отдыхал между походами то есть э, вот, вот там полная полная да, да. да. скажи там угу. что, Ой, я, ну, и хотел бы сказать что самое главное за что проживальский прожил свою жизнь это действительно свобода и он своим примером показал что можно жить свободно даже в несвободной стране в жутком царизме но он жил свободным как птица Подожди, а вот. где живем? Ты еще не осознал. Я и хотел бы за этот идеал и этого человека выпить. Вышел ряд. Well, this is the village of Sloboda, which means freedom. At least it was until the inhabitants discovered that a great explorer had lived amongst them. And now it's been renamed, well, in 1964, it was renamed Prashowski. As soon as the villagers of Sloboda realized they once had a hero living amongst them, they started renovating Pershavalsky's house. It's still work in progress, but one day they hope the tourists will pour into Pershavalsky's village. There's one thing missing, though. There's no bar yet to flush away the strong aftertaste of the hunter's vodka. Well, there was constant anxiety about water most of the time, and Prashowski's travels in the Far East. And listen to this, look, in some places, the precious fluid was not more than three feet below the surface. In most of the roadside wells, it was generally very bad. And to make it worse, the Dungans often threw into them the bodies of dead Mongols. I cannot help shuddering now. When I remember how one day After having drunk tea, we proceeded to give some drink to the camels and discovered the putrid carcass of a man lying at the bottom of the well from which we had drawn water for our own use. Oh, more. Oh. Oh. Ah. More. The professor told me that on all his travels everywhere, Prashowski dreamed of a Russian bath, a sauna. <laughs> he wanted to be heated like this beyond endurance and flagellated, bashed with birch twigs. Oh. Oh, Jesus! There's ice in here! Well, that was a refreshing evening. Time to go back to Moscow. In two days from now, we'll take the plane to Mongolia. There, the real journey will start. But before leaving Moscow, I'll get the final answer to that still lingering question. Was Pershavalsky Stalin's father? Ah, Nikolai Mikhailovich Prashalsky, yeah? He carries the same name as his great-grand-uncle. Ah, uh, we're being filmed. And he decided to have his DNA compared with that of Stalin's grandson, Berdonsky. Journal Russian News Week in 2007 organized a expedition, an operation 
по которой хотел проследить родство между несколькими знаменитыми фамилиями, вот в том числе и дворянскими. Вот, видно, и дворянскими. Это вот, вот это берут слюну из, 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 из щеки. Это пример. И в качестве одной из э, таких семей они выбрали эту экспедицию. Выбрала. Это внук э, Сталина по мужской линии э, Бурдонский, режиссер театра российской армии э, в Москве. А это Николай Михайлович Пожевальский, значит, профессор кафедры органической химии. Вот. Значит, у нас взяли эту слюну, приезжали, и потом провели анализ на ДНК, ДНА э, в лаборатории в Соединенных Штатов Америки. В результате этого было ус четко установлено, доказано, что мы принадлежим, Иосиф Сталин и Николай Проживальский, принадлежат к разным гаплоидным группам. То есть они не могут быть в родстве. Про Монголию нет. Well, yeah. Это место последней стоянки отряда Проживальского. Вот где-то вот здесь. Мы были в этом месте. Там Китай. Китай. Это дорога наикратчайшая на Тибет. И это место, где он погиб? Нет, это место последней стоянки отряда, где он уже был болен. Оттуда его перевезли в Каракол, в госпиталь. А сколько ему было, когда он умер? Почти 50. 49. 49, 49 лет. Что с ним произошло вообще? Как, что произошло? А, значит, точно не знает никто, но версия, что он выпил холодной сырой воды из реки, а в Киргизии зимой и летом был тиф. То есть он заразился брюшным тифом. Он умер от брюшного тифа. И он представлял себе, что очень тяжело заболел и отдал все необходимые распоряжения до смерти. Хотя и врачи к нему были приглашены, но они ничего не могли сделать. Тогда еще не умели лечить эту болезнь. Не было антибиотиков, не было антибиотиков нынешних. Вот. И, а похоронен он еще в 12 километрах от, этого, э, от Каракола на берегу озера Иссык-Куль. Похороните меня на берегу mm -hmm. Сыкуля в экспедиционной одежде. Сфотографируйте меня с ружьем в гробу. Пожалуйста, вскрытие не делайте. И ну, напишите просто... Напишите просто путешественник Проживальский. Это э, фотография путешественника Проживальского э, в гробу, э, как он желал, чтобы его сфотографировали вместе с его любимым ружьем Ланкастером. Наскоро одели, обули войлочные сапоги и, посадив на верблюда, пошли далее. Через три версты встретился ключ, на котором мы разбили свой бивак. Затем обмыли теплый I don't understand a word of it, but it doesn't matter. It sounds wonderful. The professor brings us to the airport. I will miss him. He envies us. I'm sure he would have loved to come along to the Altai Mountains of Mongolia. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you liked it. If so, you can watch the next episode here. Or check another recommended series on our channel. And don't forget to subscribe to get updates on new series.